Welcome to the Got Academy podcast. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. It's going airborne. Well, we used to look up in the sky and wonder at our place in the Hi stars. Hi, everybody. Hi, Dr. Utrevoz. How? Shalom, Chavalim. It's your boy, Dr. Utrevoz. Oh my goodness, you are here. We, you are in Tel Aviv. Welcome. Welcome to our country. Thank you. Thank you. It's Good. warm here. It is warm, but it's actually hotter in Europe. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, right yes, now. it's unusually hot in Europe right now, so I'm uh, fleeing to the cool. And actually, this is a great uh, setup for today's topic. What to talk is about? Hyper disaster! Natural disaster! Natural disasters. I think it might become a three-part series. So, the first disaster that we talked about was, you know, a minor mishap at the Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov ah. nuclear facility, <laughs> which was survivable. What does the decimeter say? Uh, Three point six Rontgen, but that's as high as the meter. Three point six. Not great, not terrible. Yeah, Now okay. we're moving on to the, the Middle League yeah. ones. Of course, I guess we have to top it off with the tragic defeats of the Dutch football team in '74. And 78. <laughs> oh, my God. For the second time in two World Cups, Holland's dream would falter at the final stage. Our American listeners have no idea what you are talking about. And the first, your first example, you're talking about our Chernobyl podcast. It's a great conversation. Look for it and scroll down a little bit. And now I want to talk about uh, natural disasters. We have three movies that represent three different natural disasters. What are those disasters and what are those movies? So the movies are really shitty, but the disasters are uh, respectively an asteroid is about to hit the Earth. <gasps> oh no. And, uh, Armageddon. It's Armageddon. Which is, I think, like shitty, good shitty. It's yes. not like shitty shitty. It was entertaining. Entertaining, shitty. So, uh, but Bruce Willis, he's Bruce still Willis. okay, right? Bruce Willis, has he done any like racism or No, sexism? he's like a good conservative. He's Maybe the, one of the few remaining ones. Bruce Willis, still okay so far. So far. Bruce, yes. we're looking at you. Yes. <laughs> we're watching you. The uh, second movie is The Day After Tomorrow, oh. where the disaster is sudden climate change. That's awful. Yeah. 2012. Armageddon, that's 1999? Something like that. Late 90s. It's late 90s. Yeah, late 90s. And yeah. the third one? And the third one is Super Volcano. Ah, uh, that's like the Tommy Lee Jones Volcano movie? It's another volcano movie. The Dante's Peak uh, Brosnan movie? Also not. What is Super Volcano? It's uh, a made-for-TV movie, <laughs> which actually has marginally higher ratings on IMDb uh. Than either one of those, but I guess the main point is it's a volcano, and this one's bigger right. than the other two volcano movies. Right. And we're we're now playing in the big leagues. Okay, this oh. is this is really mass extinction level natural disasters, right? Not like a little area, but it's just like changing the course of history of life on Earth. That scale is what we're talking about. Okay, so why would humans create so many movies? and also TV shows and books, stories in general, fantasizing and thinking about a possible annihilation. It's like it's an enemy, but it's okay to lose to this enemy. I think that's part of that. Oh, I like it. Right. It's not an evil enemy, it's just like a neutral enemy. Yeah, it's, there, nobody's to blame, really. Except the day after tomorrow. A, a lot of people are to blame over there. Yeah, but still, like it's uh, it's for America, it's okay to lose this one because this is just like nature and it's not like the Russians or something. <laughs> or the Arabs. Or the Arabs, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about the larger theme. So first of all, the theme of annihilation, you can also th th think about it like psychologically, individually, right? Uh, thinking about death, 
our own demise, fantasizing about it, how it would look, how society would react to the possible threat of its uh, destruction. Right. Well, it, and I think it should also be pointed out, I mean, we live in a time where, rightly, we uh, are told that, of course, people who might be males, white, cis, hetero... Are like, horrible. Like I am. Are horrible people. We are, we are privileged in many, many ways, and I realize that. But when you look at these movies, we have to realize that people like me are really targeted disproportionately by these natural disasters. <laughs> Why? Why so? You can see them running, <laughs> saving people ahead of like the you know the pyroclastic flow or the ice age that's suddenly sweeping in. It's always straight white dudes. So please, uh. you know, the struggle is real. <laughs> We're doing what we can. Okay. Thanks. It's because you are more important than the Africans. You never see anything getting destroyed in Africa because people wouldn't care. But I don't know. Would Hollywood show like a shanty a shanty town getting destroyed in South Africa? People would be like, yeah, it was shitty to begin with. This, it's not okay. me, it's like Hollywood, I'm not, uh, okay. it's not it's me. It's just on you. No, 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 I'm just saying what they are thinking. I'm, 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 I'm not thinking that myself, I assure you. So you want to start with uh, Armageddon? Sure. Oh, Armageddon. Such a bad, good movie. Yes. Such a bad, good movie. Oh. And I think, this is, first of all, it's clearly pre 911 America. Yes. This is just like a relic from an America that doesn't exist anymore. You have a movie in the movie you have things falling from the sky on New York City, destroying buildings. Yeah. You would not have that after 911. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So God is everywhere in this movie. The Bible calls this day Armageddon, the end of all things. There's this asteroid, and they're like, let's pray to God. God, please, let me uh, be able to dig this hole inside this asteroid. God, 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 God. Oh, Jesus. Damn it. This is pre-MAGA, pre-9-11, pre-Al-Qaeda, pre-all that shit. If you would have the same movie today, the people digging the, the holes in the asteroid, they would not be as religious, and NASA guys would not be religious at all. Mm -hmm. Also, there are gun jokes over there, which you would not have today after all the mass shootings that happen. Make your peace with God, AJ! This guy's got a gun, man! He's shooting at me! Harry, this is not funny! Harry, listen to me! We can talk this over! Mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you have, you, of course you have sexist jokes, but you also have pedophilia jokes, like underage jokes. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. Steve Buscemi has like, uh, when the FBI is coming over, it's like, uh, we're telling the Bruce Willis, Harry, uh, I swear I didn't know how old she was. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I slept with a 15 year old and I'm 35. <laughs> that was a little uncomfortable, yeah. It yeah, was uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, okay, so the good guys, they are religious, conservative, male they dig oil mm -hmm. i don't think people are digging oil and and so it's not a corp an oil corporation it's a small business oil company the of backbone course. of this nation <laughs> yeah the small business oil companies so many small these business mom oil and pop shops <laughs> these, little, these little oil companies <laughs> <laughs> ah, this is like really, yeah, corporate oil, small business. This is quintessential America. Yes. Someday, many years from now, when you're all grown up and you got your own oil company and eight million dollars of your own money on the contract, you can do whatever comes into that little AJ idiot mind of yours you want. Oh, there was another thing at the beginning when they present the characters when they're on the rig, oil rig. They're harassing or they're just like throwing stuff on the... The, those pieces of shit, Greenpeace, that care about the environment. Oh, Greenpeace caring about the environment. Boo! Boo! Tree huggers. <laughs> ah, yeah. oh, no, they are the bad guys. They are the assholes. Oh my goodness, that was really funny. That was really funny. Yeah, we learned really something interesting also about this, uh, these uh, wildcat uh, uh, oil drillers. So apparently that's a job 
that's harder than being an astronaut. Because they could have also trained astronauts to drill a hole. No, no, no. It's, it's got to be the other way around. You got to take these drillers, and within 18 days, they have to become the astronauts. Yeah. Because that's way easier. We got to come up with something realistic here. We got 18 days. That's 431 hours, 15 minutes, and 18 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drilling is so hard. They can't just like tell you, click the, just do a remote in the radio now. More, now, now stop. Click, now not, drill the hole. Yeah, drill the hole. hole. Don't press the button now. Okay, press it now. Okay, that's it. Yeah. We're saved. No, no, this is really difficult. Hey, you want to send these boys into space? Fine. I'm sure they'll make good astronauts. But they don't know jack about drilling. Also, it was uh, really like Ameri American centric in a way that would not be today. You have like this one Russian dude. Yeah. That's it. And he's uh, like, he fucks everything up and he drinks too much on the space yes. station. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah, but it's also like pre Putin, right? It's not yeah. like he's a, he's a good guy, they're friends. Yeah, this is Yeltsin, Russia. This is Yeltsin, Russia. He's not threatening anymore. He's no. like all like. Uh, he's kind of goofy, he's kind of fun, and he drinks a bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I am not a gas station. This is sophisticated laboratory. I'm in charge. So do not be touching anything. This is also something that uh, that uh, that would not happen uh, this way to, uh, today. You see the American flag everywhere in this movie, just like in the backdrop everywhere, huge American flags. This is again pre-Trump, yeah. pre-Trump. Today you would not have like this would be a liberal movie mm -hmm. today. Back then for them it wasn't uh, like the flag wasn't uh, that threatening. The yeah. American flag. Yeah, today there would have been like. Chinese astronauts, for example, so sort, sort of international coalition. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Chinese here, nobody cares. No. Just see, and you see like the Indians pray, everybody's praying, yeah. right? And you see the Indians, they're praying in the Taj Mahal. I don't think they would do that. No. <laughs> I don't think that that is where you, they would go to this mausoleum in the Taj Mahal to pray. I think they have it's, other it's temples. It's not a religious building. Right? No. It's a mausoleum. It's a mausoleum. But I was like, what the, this is just like... Let's go pray in the Colosseum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's pray by the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> oh, but there is the Eiffel Tower, right? That's like a, So America is being hit and Paris. Yes. Also, but also Japan. Just a bit, but you don't see really any Japanese. No. We were talking about sexist jokes. So you have like a female astronaut and uh, immediately... So it just mirrors what's really hot. <laughs> but I want to fact check the science with you. Also. Yes. So they're saying, and there's like a clear appeal to authority there with a very, very shallow explanation why you can't bomb it from the outside, but from the inside. There's a guy telling the president, your uh, advisors are stupid, I got a better grades in school, listen to me, we have to do it from the inside. This is Dr. Ronald Quincy from Research, pretty much the smartest man on the planet, you might want to listen to him. Why do you think about that? Well, so disaster movies, okay, they want to show us disasters and there's not really a good story, so the real story is we want to show some spectacular shit and put humans next to it for scale basically, right? <laughs> so that's, so you have to have like people there and because the, the disaster itself has no, there's no character development or anything there. So there has to be like right. a love interest and all that bullshit that comes with it. And you see that in all these movies. Mm -hmm. But what they also do in all these movies is blow up the disaster even bigger than they need to go at all, right? What do you mean? So the asteroids that killed the dinosaurs, okay was uh, maybe like 50 kilometers in diameter and this How much one that in, in miles for our american listeners that's like about 30 miles um and this one is the size of texas Yeehaw! right mm -hmm. so that's like more than 10 times as big and what and then they're gonna drill like i guess the logic makes a little bit of sense that you would split it from the inside out yeah. But what, they're gonna drill halfway the diameter of Texas? No, they go a couple hundred meters in, like that, that, that does nothing. Okay, so you drill, you drop the nuke, and you leave. And why not just blow it up from one side and have it go to the other side? Right, why indeed? 
And how come they only found out... Okay, so that was also a thing, like, uh, they only found out at the last second and they were saying uh, we only have enough budget to survey about 3% of the sky. I think they know everything that's coming over, right? I, I don't know if they know everything, but a lot of these asteroids have a predictable trajectory going from the outer reaches of the solar system and then closer to us and then back and they come back once in a while and they can really predict decades ahead okay that one is going like a uh, tutatis something or other <laughs> <laughs> that one is going to come uh, a couple of uh, the uh, distances from here to the moon near us so let's keep an in eye in a hundred years though or two hundred years something well like that. at least decades ahead but there might be a little bit of wobble further ahead but but kind of like that yeah but there was one moment i want to see how you felt about that moment that I actually shed a tear. That was when, so there was a, like a Harry's friend, Bruce Willis's friend, he went to see his ex-wife and his child and, uh, and they're estranged and he hasn't been in his uh, son's life. And she tells the son, this is uh, a sense. And then when they're going to the spaceship, the son says, and I can feel myself getting goosebumps right now, he says, that has nourished our souls. Children, and, and now I'm getting uh, the chills. And she just like watches with the sun. And she's like, that man's not a salesman. That's your daddy. And me being a father, I was like, okay, this works. <laughs> this I, works. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, that bit was, uh, that works. And he just like showed me how much, even though we don't show it, how much we crave like uh, ultimate approval from our children that we did good, yeah. we did good. And then by the end of the movie, spoiler alert, they beat the, the win against the asteroid and his son is there hugging him. And that was another emotional uh, moment for me. Don't yeah. make fun of my emotions. No. You want to move on to a day after tomorrow? What do you want to do? You have some more stuff uh, to say? Uh, I have one thing to say, which is um, what we can measure these disasters against. Uh, so on the Twitter I posted uh, some uh, animated GIFs of the Tsar Bomba nuclear explosion, which is uh, the largest nuclear explosion that uh, has ever been done. Um, which Twitter? Got Academy Twitter? Uh, Got Academy Twitter. Got Academy underscore Twitter. Check it out. Yes. Because the Russians, they have this thing where if, if they make something really, really big, they call it the Tsar something. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, went, I went to Moscow at one time to mm. teach at the university there. And I went to look on the, at the Kremlin, they, on the grounds of the Kremlin there, they have this massive cannon, like from the time where they sort of front load those things. And it was this cast, a really sculpted thing, and that was the Tsar cannon. <laughs> uh, but then in the, I think the 60s they had the Tsar Bomba and that was the largest nuclear explosion ever. Where? Uh, somewhere in, uh, in the Russian Arctic and then as an air burst. So there wasn't even that much fallout on the ground. Okay. Um, and so for example the uh, asteroid that uh, killed the dinosaurs, which is 10 times smaller than the one in Armageddon, okay. that explosion was a hundred million times as powerful as the Tsar Bomba. A hundred million times? Yes. So if an asteroid decides that that killed the dinosaurs would hit the Earth today, we would all die. Yes. So how did the mammals survive the last, uh, this, this, this mass extinction? We were so smaller, right? They were small, they were probably living underground, near the ground, and they uh, could conserve their body heat. So mammals and fur conserve their body heat, and the dinosaurs that survived are the birds, which also, because of their feathers, could conserve their body heat. Ah. So perhaps there was some sort of nuclear winter where it was really advantageous. We don't know, for sure. We don't really know, but it, it seems likely that that's what happened. Interesting, interesting. Uh, okay, so let's go to a day after to, to the day after tomorrow. Yes, this is global warming, climate change, boom, just like that. In a few weeks, everything changes. The long night. Yes. 
how scientifically viable, plausible is what they are describing over there. Basically, they're describing that the Gulf Stream stops running. Yeah. So there's this uh, circulation of warm water that goes through the Atlantic, basically from the Caribbean and then further up north, uh, ending up by Scandinavia, more or less. But it, when that stops, then all of a sudden things get colder. And actually there's two things about the day after tomorrow which are worth keeping in mind. So one of them is that the traditional view of ice ages was that these are events that kind of gradually come up and gradually go away. And okay. what we now think we know is that some of these cooling events were things that people would have noticed over the course of their lifetime. So not that you have to like outrun the freeze and oh, get into the building and upstairs wow. because the that ice was, is coming. That was ridiculous. I want to ask you, is that... No, that's absurd. We have to get out of here now. Try and get this device. But this is just uh, like to make it a horror movie yeah. when they're at the eye of the storm. Oh, you see the ice coming. <laughs> coming out. Run, run, run. The ice age is right. coming. No, no. <laughs> it's as if the hand, like the hand of a monster is reaching out. No, it's not like that, but it's... Um, uh, the span of a couple decades, for example. And the other thing that is probably true is the effect of the Gulf Stream shutting down. Well, we found something extraordinary. Extraordinary and disturbing, that is. You recall what you said in New Delhi about how polar melting might disrupt the North Atlantic current? Yes. Well... So what they're actually refer referring to in Day After Tomorrow mm -hmm. is the last cold spell of the last ice age. So it's a time called the Younger Dryas, which is named after this little flower which you can see in drill cores. It's like an Arctic flower which all of a sudden spread again. And it's an indicator of all of a sudden it got way colder again. Ah, and spread in places that are now not Arctic. Right. Okay. Right. What we have found locked in these ice cores is evidence of a cataclysmic climate shift which occurred around 10,000 years ago. The concentration of these natural greenhouse gases in the ice cores indicates that runaway warming pushed the planet into an ice age which lasted two centuries. Yes, it is a paradox, but global warming can trigger a cooling trend. Let me explain. The Northern Hemisphere owes its temperate climate to the North Atlantic Current. Heat from the sun arrives at the equator and is carried north by the ocean. But global warming is melting the polar ice caps and disrupting this flow. Eventually, it will shut down. And when that occurs, there goes our warm climate. And so the understanding now is that it went as follows. North America was covered with an enormous ice sheet and that started melting and formed this enormous lake uh, at the center of Canada, more or less. It was a lake as big as the Black Sea. And so this lake was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden it spilled into the Arctic Ocean. The understanding is that that probably caused the shutdown of the Gulf Stream and that plunged the Earth back into this cold spell of about a thousand years which all of a sudden it got way colder and so much so that actually in, for example, where we are now in the Middle East, uh, it got a bit cooler, but also a lot drier and that drove people into the river valleys. And then maybe that was the impetus for starting to actually grow your own food. Interesting. But I want to understand the Gulf Stream. How does it operate? So this is like a warm stream inside the Atlantic. So you told me this, like Lisbon is at the same uh, latitude as New York City. Yeah. It's warmer, way, way warmer than New York City. Yes. And that's the Gulf Stream. Yes. Okay. So all the big oceans have these circulations uh, of like warm water at the surface going one way and then colder water going the opposite way. And why does it get hot and warm and why does it get cold? So it's warm in the tropics. Okay. And then it moves, and then it, it cools down, and then sort of the return flight is, is way deeper of cold water from the Arctic. So it's not warmer all around, it's just warmer in, U in, it, in it's Europe? It's warmer one way, and then colder going the other way. Okay. Okay. So there's like a, like a similar stream in, in the Pacific? Pacific? Yeah, sure. 
No, I didn't know that. And in the Indian Ocean as well. Yeah. They're pre- they're, it's a Native American ocean, sorry. Old gaan. <laughs> <laughs> so in the day after tomorrow. <laughs> I apologize, everyone. Sorry. A bit old fashioned here. The Red Sea, is that also not okay? Anymore? No, no. What the hell? It's yeah. the Jewish Sea. <laughs> okay. So, day after tomorrow, that's 2012. That's already yeah. different. You have the UN, you have scientists from all over the world. It's more international, like the Americans there are way less pompous and vain and sure of themselves than we what we see in Armageddon. Yeah, and Dick Cheney is in this movie. Ah, right, it's Dick Cheney. Please explain, please explain. Well, so uh, at the beginning of the movie, the, uh, the scientist hero, or the older scientist hero, uh, has to present to uh, some kind of international panel of, I think, oil ministers. Um, and so then he has to explain this story of, well, actually, because of global warming, there's meltwater, and it could actually cause a cooling event. And then there's this guy who looks exactly like uh, Dick Cheney and, you know, being the Halliburton operative that he is. <laughs> like, ha, 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 you know, how is this possible? Uh, global warming could cause cooling, are oh, you? Whatever, scientists. This is silly, you know, we have to think about business. That's exactly. If we do not act soon, it is our children and our grandchildren who will have to pay the price. And who's going to pay the price of the Kyoto Accord? It will cost the world's economy hundreds of billions of dollars. With all due respect, Mr. Vice President, the cost of doing nothing could be even higher. Our economy is every bit as fragile as the environment. Perhaps you should keep that in mind before making sensationalist claims. Definitely a sign of the times that they had him in there. That was definitely intended to remind us of Dick Cheney. Right. And, and, and he was, even though they didn't say, he was clearly Republican. And then by the end, when they enter an ice age, uh, Americans uh, immigrate uh, to Mexico. Yeah. And this was also great back then, but now it's even better. Yeah. It's so awesome to watch this now and to think about how incredible that would be. And the Mexicans let them in. Uh, in exchange of uh, forgiving uh, the entire debt of Latin America. These past few weeks have left us all with a profound sense of humility in the face of nature's destructive power. For years, we operated under the belief that we could continue consuming our planet's natural resources without consequence. We were wrong. I was wrong. The fact that my first address to you comes from a consulate on foreign soil is a testament to our changed reality. Not only Americans, but people all around the globe are now guests in the nations we once called the third world. In our time of need, they have taken us in and sheltered us. And I am deeply grateful for their hospitality. Even though it's their fault that the world is now turned to shit. Yes. This is the Americans' fault. Industrialized nations. And I, th- I think Americans are responsible for like a third of all like a greenhouse ga- gases and stuff. Th- does it have to do with greenhouse gases? That's where, what caused, what, what was the trigger in the movie scientifically that caused this uh, Gulf Stream to, to stop? Uh, human caused climate change. It's very general. Well, so it's greenhouse gases, um, CO2. So we talked about the last ice age, which is sort of the ice ages that we think of with, you know, humans hunting mammoths and sort of half of the continents are covered in ice. And as you go towards the equator, it's a bit more livable and so on. Like this is what we imagine about ice ages. But uh, what maybe not all listeners know is that there have actually been much more severe ice ages further in the past, where actually... When we were alive? When you no, no, existed? no, way, like mm-hmm. hundreds of millions of years uh, uh, ago. Uh, for example, there was uh, an ice age called the Cryogenian, and cryo is like ice, right? right. And genian or genian is like birth. And what's interesting about that one is that uh, the Earth was probably an entire snowball or ice no. ball. Really? Yeah. 
And right after that, that's when the first, all the different sort of, many of the different forms of animals pretty suddenly appeared in uh, the fossil record. So it was like this, this weird uh, sort of moment where the, you know, the whole uh, earth was thrown into disarray and right after a new opportunity appeared and all of a sudden, uh, at least that's what it looks like in the fossil record, a lot of different forms of animals uh, appeared quite suddenly. And so this is about like uh, 700 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's an even freakier one, which is about two and a half billion years ago, oh. which is referred to as the oxygen holocaust. <laughs> oh, yeah. Another holocaust? Yeah, so uh, what happened then was that first uh, plants uh, um, appeared and evolved photosynthesis. And so they started very quickly taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and pumping O2 into it. Mm. And that caused kind of a reverse greenhouse effect. Okay. Right. That's a good and, thing. Well, except For us, that, because we breathe oxygen. Sure. But at the time, there wasn't anything that breathed right. oxygen. So there was right. a runaway reverse greenhouse effect. And what happened first was that all the iron that was uh, uh, dissolved in the seas sort of uh, deposited because it became like rust, like, you know, oh, like no. oxygen and iron. So we see that in the fossil record, we see really? the red bands. And then after that was exhausted, there was another snowball earth ah. for a while. Or maybe a slush ball earth, which is this idea that almost the entire earth was covered in snow and ice. And around the equator, there was this sort of, this band of slush puppy where there was a little bit of movement still. But and, and, and we're talking about very ancient life forms. I'm this guessing. yeah, two billion years ago. So that is like uh, so the Earth is like four and a half billion years old, and like you know the dinosaurs went extinct sixty-five million years ago. A million, yeah. And and we as a species have been around for like two hundred thousand years, right? So if you try to plot that on a time scale, wow. we're talking about really way way <laughs> in the past of the earth when there was nothing uh, even multicellular and certainly uh -huh. not with any sort of intelligence or anything around like the the history of intelligent life on earth is very recent ah they don't have a forecast model there for for climate change that's actually still true right there are no forecast models remotely capable of plotting this scenario except yours. My model is a reconstruction of a prehistoric climate shift. It's not a forecast model. It's the closest thing we have. So what they say in the movie is that they have some uh, models and they have these, they refer uh, briefly to these uh, compute clusters, the kind of stuff that I've also worked on. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and how they all of a sudden try to claim compute cycles without using the sign-in sheet. I don't know how this could possibly work. <laughs> Tom, we're building a forecast model. We're gonna need what? Priority access to the mainframe for two days, maybe three. Oh, is that it? Anything else? We need it immediately. You know, I would say that you've lost your mind, but uh, you've been this way for the past 20 years. But uh, no, what, the, what they're saying is basically they never run the kind of model which is like this younger dry ass ice age model. Um, and so now they want to run that model on the meteorology kind of infrastructure to come up with new predictions. And then all of a sudden, of course, the model works. And then you see these three enormous uh, disaster, whatever, hurricane, ice things on the earth, and it all fits perfectly. And did you see which, uh, which station covered the, the, the climate change? Oh, no, I forgot, no. That was Fox News. Ooh. Fox News, that was a shot at Fox News. <laughs> they were like, Fox News reporters got, got killed <laughs> because of climate change. Bus just got dropped on top of that Porsche. Oh my God, I hope no one was in that car. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, okay, so, so you, you were saying that you, you, you are running uh, models uh, similarly. Are you also like a super athlete? Like at the first scene or the second scene, he jumps like in the Arctic when like, this ice shelf uh, collapses, he can jump incredibly on top of it, and then afterward he runs, and he, he, he's like an Indiana Jones character. That's like also this uh, f fantasy of this uh, 
super athletic and uh, potent uh, scientist. Well, this, that part is all very accurate, yeah. And I think the people who will see me in the videos coming up will see that, you know, you might not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. And the scientists <laughs> like I am are just af very athletic, just in general. Because you have to train to be athletic as a scientist. It's this one of the requirements. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. to get your PhD, doctor. Yes, yeah. You wanna? Do you, do you feel like we can uh, move over to the to the super volcano movie? Yeah. Mm. So this is and, about and, uh, so huh? uh, because this is a movie that nobody will have seen and that's uh, very boring and nobody will see. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But you can see it on uh, YouTube, by the way. Huh. So I think here I should uh, insert um, some uh, extra material which I'm going to announce now. For the Patreon. For the Patreon. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, Patreon. So, the, the channel and the podcast are sustained and supported exclusively by the Patreons. You can go on patreon.com slash gotacademy uh, if you want to help us uh, make as many of these as we can for the long haul, we could really use your support. Yes, please. Yes, please. This would be very much appreciated. And we also post on every single podcast that you and I do, Utrecht, uh, an extra bit, either about an extra movie or if, we, if there's just like extra material that we feel would be too data intensive for the larger audience. But if people are curious about any kind of thing, in the King, King Arthur uh, extra bit, you went into detail about uh, large parts of history, of European history, Roman history, and stuff like that. And here you say that you have a lot of uh, cool facts about uh, underground volcanoes? No, it's, uh, it's even cooler. <coughs> We're gonna talk a bit about volcanoes. And uh, so volcanoes have like, there's a rating scale of how intense they are, right? Just like for okay. anything, for earthquakes, it's the Richter scale and so on. Uh -huh. Volcanoes, it's the volcanic explosivity index. Volcanic Explosivity Index. Okay, that's not very catchy. Yeah, it was the VEI. Oh. And so, for example, a VEI 4 event was Mount St. Helens in 1980. 25 years ago today, a Como 4 News photographer had a hunch. So Dave Crockett headed to Mount St. Helens, pretty sure that something was going to happen. Boy, was he right. He spent the night there, and then at 8.32 a.m., May 18, 1980, the volcano blew its top. Como Force Bob Thronson says Crockett was an eyewitness to what he called hell on earth. Okay. And the uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the Aya uh, Fiatlajekul, uh, which was uh, uh, ah this one. Yeah. Well, so I checked on Wikipedia. There's a, an Icelandic person who pronounced it correctly. <laughs> so we'll splice that in right now. Click. Aya um, Fiatlajekul. Ah. So that was in uh, 2010, ah. which uh, impeded the uh, air traffic across I the Atlantic. I remember that, of course. So there was a VEI-4. What about Pompeii? You there know? was VEI-5. Ah. Um, and so Mount Pinatubo and the Vesuvius were both VEI-5 events. June 12, 1991. The Philippines. After a series of earthquakes felt around the country, everyone in the Philippines is busy making their lives move forward. Kids go to school. Workers go to their workplaces, and it was a normal day for all Filipinos. But under the ground, a volcano is making its deathly move. Mount Pinatubo, standing at 4,900 feet and located 55 miles north of Manila. Then at 1.42 p.m. on June 15, 1991, comes one of the single most cataclysmic natural events of the 20th century. A release of energy 200,000 times greater than the Hiroshima atomic blast. A cubic mile, five cubic kilometers of magma detonates straight up, reaching the stratosphere in seconds. So the scale is always about how much they eject in terms of mass, okay. right? So a VEI-4 event is less than one cubic kilometer of stuff. Yeah. So VEI-4, like Four. Mount St. Helens, there was uh, a quarter of a cubic kilometer. So a quarter of a cubic kilometer. So you have to imagine like maybe a block of a one by one by one kilometer. Anything below that is 
VEI 4 max. Then okay. VEI 5 is between 1 and 10. Whoa. So that's already... It's a big difference between 1 and 10. Yeah, so this is a log scale, right? Whoa. Vesuvius was about 3.3 cubic kilometers of mass <sighs> ejected into the sky. In how, in how long, in how long or short uh, span of time? So this is really the explosion, right? So The first one, just the like initial explosion? This is just like, there goes the mountain. A VEI-6 level event was the Mount Krakatau in Indonesia in 1883. Krakatoa, a remote Indonesian island, blew up in 1883 and remains the deadliest volcanic eruption in recorded history. The detonation was heard 3,000 miles away and created a tsunami 100 feet high that drowned 36,000 people. And there was an explosion four times as powerful as the Tsar Bomba. But it was already four times as big as the biggest nuclear explosion ever. And here, wow. and, and so now here comes the extra material. Um, or one of my ancestors on my mom's side. Okay, so this is now just for the patrons now? Yeah, I'm, I'm, now I'm just priming the, priming the pump, like ah, what, what's okay. going to happen. So now everybody gets to hear what you're saying right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, so... One of your ancestors? One of my ancestors, uh, Albert Fish, was as a 15-year-old boy, he went to sea, and he went, uh, of course, on the Dutch uh, marine vessels to Indonesia. Which was uh, a colony. Which was in the Dutch, Dutch East Indies. And he... Uh, kept a shipping journal, his diary, and we have the diary, nah. and he observed the event. Nah. So there's going to be readings out of his diary. Nah, really? You brought it here? I have it. Oh, this is incredible. That's this cool. belongs in right? the museum. You never told me that. No, I wanted to keep you excited. But we've known each other for a few years also. Yeah. I feel like you should have told me before. This is from the Family Chronicles. Incredible. Yeah. So okay. that's the VEI 6. Right? Okay. Uh, so, th and that is between um, 10 and 100 cubic kilometers of mass. Wow. Once again, on a log scale, right? So, okay. And in this case, be because it's between 10 and 100, in this case, the estimate for Krakatau is 20 cubic kilometers. So, in that case, there will be about 3 by 3 by and 3. And what was the damage that that explosion caused? That's a lot of damage. Yeah. But it didn't destroy humanity or whatever. It didn't destroy humanity, but there was some reconfiguration of the islands in the area. Ah. And it, I guess... Sounds like the a euphemism, reconfiguration of the islands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have to reconfigure your islands, please, natives. Okay. Uh, and so then, okay, then we go to VEI-7. That was also in the 19th century and also in Indonesia. The explosion of Mount Tambora, which was in 1815. Okay. And that was 120 cubic kilometers, so 5 by 5 by 5 kilometers in block. Ooh. Right? And so that actually was the wow. last time that in the Western world and in Europe there was mass starvation because that was the year without a summer, 1815. And it was. So gloomy that when, uh, let's see, uh, Lord Byron... 1815? 1815, Lord, Lord Byron... Napoleon and, and stuff. Okay, it's Lord right Byron. after, it's the year after Waterloo. Okay. Lord um, Byron? Byron and Mary Shelley and Polidori spent their summer in Villa Diodati in Switzerland. It was, there was like a couple of noble people okay. and sort of writers spending the summer and they were, thought they were going to vacation and have a nice summer holiday, but the whole summer was so gloomy and rainy and dark that they stayed inside and started writing stories. And this is the beginning of the Gothic literature. Really? They, in that summer, they wrote, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein and Polidori wrote the, the vampire story. That's the Dracula story. This is awesome stuff. That's what volcanoes can do on the other side Volcano of the world. Volcanoes on the other side of the world change Western culture. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And brought a whole new field and topic and theme into Western stories. Yes. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. In the name of God. Now I know what it feels like to be God. 
Even though, so Frankenstein is like a man-made disaster, quote unquote, which was caused by a natural disaster. Yes. Not caused, triggered. Triggered, yeah. Okay, so in the movie, it's an underground. Right. Are we, are, are we not there yet? Now we're getting to the movie. Okay, yeah. underground volcano. Yeah. First of all, does that volcano really exist? It's a Yellowstone. It Yellowstone. does exist. It's a real volcano in Yellowstone, underground volcano. What, what we have beneath our feet here at Yellowstone is a, is a type of volcano, a type of hidden volcano, uh, referred to as a, as a restless caldera. Uh, caldera, because you'll note it resembles the shape of a uh, cauldron, and uh, restless because it spends much of its life doing what, what you see it's doing right here. It's huffing and puffing as the magma and the hydrothermal systems beneath the ground rise and fall uh, for reasons that we actually don't fully yet understand. So Yellowstone basically is, you can't really call it one giant volcano, but there's, it, what they say in this movie is actually kind of accurate. There is this big bubble of magma or this thinning of the Earth's crust underneath Yellowstone, which is why there's all the geysers and all these weirdly colored lakes and things, and there's the tremors and all that. And so, and Yellowstone has actually erupted a bunch of times on a massive scale. So these are VEI8 level oh. events. Okay, tell me what we just saw. All right, all right, I'll say it. it if we have a reservoir of meltdown there that's larger than 125 cubic kilometers, then this model is telling us that even a moderate eruption near Norris could destabilize the rest of the chamber and trigger a... Uh... VEI-8. Super eruption. Wow. And so Yellowstone has erupted at least three times at that level, which means it's over a thousand cubic kilometers of mass being blown into the sky. That's like a, a city, like a size of a city. A very large city. A very large city. Yeah, and then also that, that diameter deep into the ground, <gasps> let's say. So that's like projected in the, into the air so, well, and then falls So a thousand cubic down. kilometers, that is exactly 10 by 10 by 10 kilometers. So that will be like Manhattan, but also Manhattan as far down as it is long. Falling on Manhattan. Yeah, <laughs> blown, being blown into the sky. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then crashing down. And then crashing down. And hot. And hot. Yeah. A hot Manhattan crashing down. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So when was that? Uh, uh, there's at least three known events. Uh, one was where at Lava Creek it erupted, which is about 640,000 years ago. Ah, okay. Um, and then there's Huckleberry Ridge, which was uh, 2.1 million years ago. And the Heise volcanic field, actually that happened twice, four and a half million years ago, six million years ago. But that's, so that's all there, not, like not in the recent, in recent history. No, but there At was all. one uh, on that scale also in recent history, also in Indonesia, uh, the Lake Toba. It's Indonesians? Uh, What's the problem with these Indonesians? It's very explosive there, yeah. Well, yeah they should uh, calm the fuck down. Yeah. So there's, Something in uh, their culture, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot-headed. Yeah, the, the Lake Toba eruption uh, on Sumatra, which uh, created this giant crater lake, uh, was 74,000 years ago. And there's some thinking, but mm -hmm. it's a bit debated now, that that was so intense that it caused a bottleneck in human populations huh. whose signature we can still see in genetic diversity. Explain, explain. Large populations have greater genetic diversity. Okay. Small populations have less of it. Okay. And that principle you can also project into the past. So when you look at the diversity that exists among humans right now, it's lower than expected given how old we are as a species ah. and then through some clever statistics you can project backward where roughly that bottleneck must have happened that reduced genetic diversity okay and there's been some scientific papers where they try to advance the arguments that there has been this bottleneck and that it's because the well, indonesians they, well, they can kind of calculate when it must have been and then very roughly it coincides with the lake toba event but now there's other papers coming out with where it's basically well 
that bottleneck is just because you didn't sample quite enough human populations and maybe it's not really the case. Uh -huh. So this is what like current science is, we're not quite sure. Maybe there was one, maybe there wasn't. Okay, okay. My name is Richard Lieberman. I am the uh, scientist in charge of, uh, I was the scientist in charge of Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. <laughs> So, recap, the uh, movie Super Volcano is a movie about, well, it is the movie that depicts the biggest volcanic eruption conceivable, more or less, on mm -hmm. Earth. And so it's a much bigger eruption than Dante's Peak or Volcano. Mm -hmm. And it is scientifically quite accurate, so it, it has that going for it compared to these other disaster movies that is pretty well researched and it's um, not that bad and so what it describes is an eruption at Yellowstone like there have been in the past a bunch of times and to disastrous uh, effects you know uh, America basically is kicked out of the game like the very uh -huh. last shot of the movie spoiler alert uh, is a satellite image of uh, basically North America where you see the caldera of the volcano and it's like the size of utah or something like that and then because of the whole you know the eruption and everything that was ejected into the sky there's been a, like a sudden ice age so you see all of north america covered in ice and snow with that big volcano in the middle hmm. and there you have it Okay, okay, so thank you everybody for, 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 for tuning in. I, uh, we want our next podcast to be a history podcast. Yeah. And we're thinking about doing it, doing uh, one about the Roman Empire. Yes. Not the Roman Republic. Not the. Le yeah. We want to try to you know, have a, a, a century or two timeline and we'll do Gladiator, Rome, and, and another movie to be done but possibly Caligula. Maybe. Yes, because then the theme would be the decadence of the Roman Empire. Oh. And we can talk about orgies finally. <laughs> We've been talking about orgies... Uh, just not on the air. Yeah, just not on the air, yes. Finally we can talk about it on the, on the air. Yeah. And uh, so if you, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, there are a few helpful, helpful things you can do. You can give it a five-star rating, so new people coming in, discovering it, will know ahead of time how awesome it is. And you do that through iTunes, on Apple Podcasts, or uh, Spotify. On Spotify, that helps. Or wherever you catch it. Yep. Yeah. There's like a, you can see the rating over there. We have a, could, like if we compare the amount of ratings to the amount of uh, listens, there's very few, very, very few of you have been uh, giving us any ratings at all. Two out of ten thousand of you are good people. <laughs> That's a, no. just saying. Maybe okay. So if you are the two good people, thank you. Yeah. If you are the nine, you nine can still chances. redeem yourself. Yes. 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 It's not late. We believe in second chances. Yeah. Yeah. This wasn't meant essentialist. You you did a bad thing, but you can still recover from it. Right. Right. You're not in essence a bad person. But right. You, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because in action. I believe in second chances. Right. Because inaction here can be resolved just like that. There you with go. With inaction, very yeah. easy action. Yeah. Just like give it a rate. Yeah. And if you want to be an awesome person, you can tell your friends. If you have friends who are interested in uh, in podcasts, in science podcasts, in movie podcasts. I don't know, you can send them uh, whatever personally or share it on your Twitter, or Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Uh, that would be very, very much appreciated. And we want to dive into your uh, ancestors' uh, chronicles now, Otra. Yeah, so I guess we don't have a bonus movie. But that would be the bonus, uh, content. So before, the bonus content. So before we go there, thank you everybody for tuning in. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Hyper, hyper.